Uh, good morning. I call this hearing to order. Uh, we're here to examine legislation titled America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018. This is bipartisan legislation. Uh, this legislation is introduced along with Committee Ranking Member Carper, Transfer in Transportation Infrastructure Subcommittee Chairman Inhofe, and Subcommittee Ranking Member Cardin. The Senate Committee of Environment and Public Works has jurisdiction over much of our nation's water infrastructure, including locks, and dams, inland waterways, irrigation and water systems, and ports. These infrastructure systems are critical to keeping America prosperous and safe from dangerous floods and contaminated water sources. This bipartisan legislation is a result of significant work and negotiations among the members of our committee, and I want to thank each of, and every one of the members of the committee for their efforts. The discussions are ongoing. We plan to add a bipartisan manager's amendment to the bill when we mark it up later this month in order to address a number of other outstanding issues. Water infrastructure is important to every region, to every state, to every tribe, and to every community in America. America's Water Infrastructure Act is going to support our nation's economic competitiveness by increasing water storage, by deepening nationally significant ports, by addressing aging irrigation systems, and by maintaining the navigability of inland waterways across the country. In my home state of Wyoming and across the West, water storage capacity and supply are vital to local economies. Sediment buildup behind dams severely limits water storage. Our bill is going to address this problem by directing the Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engineers to develop sediment management plans for federal resort, uh, reservoirs. America's Water Infrastructure Act will also expand our nation's water storage capability by facilitating the permitting of additional reservoirs. For example, in Wyoming, the bill would approve the expansion of water storage at the Bureau of Reclamation's Fontenelle Reservoir in Lincoln County. Expanding water storage will give our farmers, ranchers, and communities a reliable supply of water in order to keep their livestock and their crops healthy. More water storage also provides an economic incentive for new businesses to grow and to create jobs throughout the nation. America's Water Infrastructure Act will also fix deteriorating irrigation systems that are vital for growing crops and for raising livestock. The legislation isn't just important for rural America. Dredging nationally significant ports and maintaining our inland waterways will enhance our growing economy. Goods and raw materials need to move from the heartland to the coast for export. The bill is designed to maintain these vital arteries of commerce. That's good for big cities and for rural communities alike. This legislation is also about health and safety. It includes provisions to repair old drinking water and wastewater systems, protecting communities from contaminated water sources. The bill will make it easier for the Army Corps to take steps to keep communities safe from flooding. It will address maintenance needs of older dams and levees that protect communities from dangerous floodwaters. Finally, this bill will create an addition to the benefit-cost ratio framework. The addition will give local state stakeholders a greater role in prioritizing Army Corps projects. Under this new provision, more projects are likely to be built in small, rural, and inland states. America's Water Infrastructure Act is going to authorize or reauthorize important water infrastructure programs and projects that benefit all 50 states. So I urge my colleagues to work with me in a bipartisan way to pass this important legislation so we can create American jobs and promote our nation's prosperity, health, and safety. With that, I'd like to turn to the ranking member and co-sponsor of the legislation, Senator Carper, for his statement. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, as my co colleagues know, I, I take the train uh, most days down to, uh, to Washington from, uh, from Delaware. And almost every day, somebody on the platform waiting to catch the train will come up to me and say, I wouldn't, want, wouldn't have your job for all the tea in China. Like, you must hate your job. I really don't at all. I feel lucky to be here. I feel lucky to serve with the men and women around us on this committee and, and in the Senate. Um, I, uh, this, is a, this is a day, I, we don't want to sp spike the football too early, but uh, this is a day to celebrate. Uh, this is a, a victory, I think, in introducing this legislation uh, for bipartisanship, for fiscal responsibility. This is a victory for environmental soundness. Uh, it's good for the economy and uh, it embraces the idea of using some common sense. So we're, uh, I think we can be proud of this. Uh, the, uh, my colleagues hear me from time to time uh, quote uh, Lincoln, what is the role of government? The role of government is to do for the people what they cannot do for themselves. Think about that. And uh, uh, one of the major roles of government is to create a nurturing environment for job creation and, and job preservation, and um, along with a lot of other stakeholders. But we try to do that, and I think successfully with this legislation. So uh, my thanks to, uh, to our colleagues. Uh, 
uh, on my, uh, my left here, Senator uh, Cardin, uh, uh, my thanks to Jim Inhoff and, and your staff, certainly to our chairman for, for working with us and with our colleagues on this committee and off the committee to uh, address America's water infrastructure needs. Our bill uh, titled America's Water Infrastructure Act is an important piece of legislation. Given that the authorization law under which the uh, Corps of Engineers currently uh, operates expires uh, come uh, December, I'm proud of the bipartisan work we've done together on this legislation. We're stronger together. And I hope that it will serve as a model for work that we on this committee, along with others, uh, can do in the future uh, this year and beyond. Before I comment on the bill, though, I, I just want to thank all the witnesses for joining us today. I especially want to thank Jeff Bullock, who's our uh, Secretary of State for the State of Delaware, who previously uh, I worked with me when I was a congressman and with my chief of staff as governor and for a little bit as a chief of staff for my first year in the United States Senate, sitting right behind him in the audience is Jonathan Jones, who, was, who uh, worked with as part of our team. He was my chief of staff. There's like two of my chiefs of staff here, uh, former chiefs of, of staff here. People ask me why I've had some success. I always surround myself with people smarter than me, and these are a couple of them. And uh, we're delighted that they're here. I want to welcome back Tony Pratt, who is the president uh, of the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association. He's been here before us as a, a senior member of our Department of, Home, uh, Department of Environmental uh, Protection and, and, and Delaware Natural Resources and Environmental Protection. And we thank Tony for joining us and all of our other witnesses, too. Uh, coastal issues are extremely important to everybody in the room, but especially to the lowest lying state in our country. That would be Delaware. And the water resources bill is critical to our state's economy as it is to many other states. But Delaware's economic reliance on the Corps' work is not unique. Over, I was astounded by this, uh, by this fact, but over 90% of U.S. overseas trade volume, over 90% of U.S. overseas trade volume moves through coastal channels that the Corps maintains. Think about that. Over 90% of U.S. overseas trade volume moves through coastal channels that the Corps maintains. They have an incredible job, incredible responsibility for, for all of us. The Corps' inland waterways and locks form a freight network. Think of it as almost as a water highway that provides access to international markets through our ports. And they also serve as critical infrastructure for uh, the U.S. military. Our bill authorizes in investments in this system in multiple ways, multiple ways. Most notably, it positions the Corps to be an active partner with ports, with communities, with states, with tribes, and other stakeholders in growing and expanding our nation's economy. <coughs> a reinvestment in this partnership is much needed. For the better part of a decade now, the executive branch has calculated water project costs and benefits in a way that has led to a backlog of unfunded and uncompleted but needed projects. Our bill works to address this problem by authorizing new funding and project planning requirements at the Corps' most local level, including individual core districts. This legislation requires local participation in the development of new district plans too. And hopefully this participation will allow for a more transparent and long-term look at the core's activities and serve to build a better groundswell of support, a better and bigger groundswell of support for increased appropriations for the agency's initiatives down the line. Our legislation also invests nationally in both coasts and uh, and in, in, in waterways, and I'm particularly proud of a provision that will support the selection of natural infrastructure alternatives as a practical solution in situations where and when the development of gray or more traditional infrastructure alone may not work. The Corps of Engineers also works to reduce risk to human safety and property damage from flooding. Flooding alone currently costs the United States billions of dollars annually. As the 2017 hurricane season illustrated, our nation needs to be ready for the next extreme storm or flood event because it is coming. Earlier this year, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, announced that the total cost for extreme weather and climate events in 2017, get this, exceeded $300 billion, a new annual record in the U.S. And it's clearly not a matter of if, the next extreme weather event is coming. It is a matter of when. Our bill allows the Secretary of the Army to waive the cost share for hazard mitigation related feasibility studies so that uh, we can be shovel ready before the next storm hits. Additionally, the bill modifies the Corps' existing emergency authorities to allow the agency to participate in storm damage recovery for a longer period of time, make more, more resilient to infrastructure decisions, and where appropriate cost share infrastructure replacements so resources can go further. The um, 
American Society of Civil Engineers Infrastructure Report Card gives our country, <coughs> country's dams, our levees, our inland waterways a D, as in dog, as in decrepit. Uh, gives our country's dams, levees, and inland waterways a D, representing an overall cumulative investment backlog of nearly $140 billion in an, un an authorized but unconstructed portfolio of $60 billion. The bill reauthorizes the Corps' dam safety program and programs and makes needed changes as proposed by civil engineers. Clearly, we have a lot of important work to do to move this bill across the goal line. However, if we continue to work as we have in a bipartisan fashion, I think we'll get the bill done. Our country will be better for it. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for your leadership on this bill and for your staff's hard work. I also want to thank our partners. I want to thank Senator Inhofe, who's worked in these vineyards before, Senator Cardin as well, for the, and, and your staffs for being a part of this process. And I just want to briefly uh, recognize the staff members who are among those who worked very hard on this bill, and they include Brian, Andy, Pauline, Lizzie, Craig, May, Jenny. In addition, I want to thank uh, Christina Basinger, Skylar Bayer, and John uh, Kane of our own staff on the minority side. All of our staff has spent countless hours working together through provisions that matter, and not just for Wyoming, not just for Delaware, but for our nation as a whole. Again, we welcome our witnesses. We look forward to hearing from each of you this morning and to making a very good piece of legislation even better in the weeks to come. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Senator Carper. I'd like to now uh, recognize the chairman of the Subcommittee on Transportation and Infrastructure, Senator Inhofe, uh, if you have some comments you'd like to share with us. Well, I do. I do. And uh, I would introduce the staff people like uh, Senator Cardin, uh, uh, Senator Carper did, except they're all over at the EPA, so they're not here today. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyway, I thank you and the ranking member, uh, Senator Cardin, for having this thing. I can remember the years that I chaired this committee. Uh, we'd gone through a number of years where we were supposed to do this, and everyone knows this. We're supposed to do it every two years. We had some periods of uh, four or six and one eight-year period where we didn't do it. And we got it back on schedule, and I applaud the leadership of this committee for continuing that now and all the people who are uh, here today. It's important that we keep it up, that we keep it uh, going, and we do it in the proper way. It's one of the few things that really works well in government is the way we do the, the word of bills. Uh, in Oklahoma, our state DOT has an eight-year plan, which is updated yearly, and it's publicly available. Now, everybody knows there are no secrets in this thing. They know what we're planning to do. They know it well in advance. They participate in it. The, uh, uh, the budget reforms in this bill will provide an ongoing five-year window of certainty and transparency and allow for more input from stakeholders when creating priorities within the Corps districts and headquarters. The bill will also help our communities in building out their water and wastewater systems and assist them in complying with the many federal mandates that are creating such so many problems for so many people. The growing communities in my state of Oklahoma, like Bartlesville, We'll be able to contract for additional water storage without breaking the bank. We've clarified language so that the stakeholders along the uh, McClellan Kerr Arkansas navigation system. Now, this system, how many people out there, I'm not all, everyone in this room knows, because you're all experts, but in, out in the real world, how many people know that we're navigable in the state of Oklahoma or in, in Arkansas as we, uh, we go through? And it is, it's kind of, it, I remember 100 years ago when I was in the state Senate, Someone came to me from the, uh, the World War II uh, Submarine Veterans Association, and they said, we'd like to demonstrate what we can do in Oklahoma. We're going to take a World War II submarine all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up through Arkansas to Oklahoma to the port of Muskogee. And they said, it couldn't be done. All my adversaries were saying, we're going to sink Inhoff with his submarine. All these things are going on. But we actually did. We got all the way up there. And it was a, a great experience, so we're on the map. Well, the entrepreneurs in Oklahoma, like Grant Humphreys, I was down his operation not too long ago, and it was, it was, I can remember when the Corps didn't provide any kind of help in recreational activity. They are doing it now, and we're doing it successfully. I know that uh, no bill is perfect, and I know there are some concerns related to the hopper dredge, and, and we're working on language, working closely with those who have a personal interest in that. We want to be sure that that uh, if the private sector has areas where the availability is, is not there, the, a compromise can be reached to try to accommodate those needs. So I look forward to continue to work with my colleagues to improve this bill, and, uh, and this would be one of the major pieces of legislation that we can all be proud of. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Senator Inhofe. And I'd now like to recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Transportation Infrastructure, Senator Cardin. Do you have comments you'd like to share with us? Well, Senator Brasso, I want to join with Senator Carper and Senator Inhofe in congratulating you for bringing this bill to the committee's attention in the best traditions of our committee. I agree we should be doing these um, reauthorizations every two years uh, in order to make sure that the authorizations are contemporary with need and it's our committee's responsibility to do it and you're carrying that out in the best traditions. It's certainly bipartisan and it's focused on clean, safe water for our nation, advancing water infrastructure for both public health and our economy and doing it in a fiscally responsible way. So I'm proud to be part of this effort. <clears throat> for our nation, let me just mention three uh, bills that I worked on with other members of this committee in the United States Senate that parts are incorporated into this America's Water Infrastructure Act. I'm pleased that a good part of S-1137, the Clean, Safe, Reliable Water Infrastructure Act is included. Senator Bozeman has been one of the leaders on that, Senator Inhofe and Senator Duckworth, uh, an important bill that deals with drinking water and wastewater uh, infrastructure in our country. Uh, parts of S-692, the Water Infrastructure Flexibility Act, Senator Fisher was very much engaged in that act along with Senator Brown that deals with the affordability, which is important to all parts of our country, but particularly in my state, uh, in Baltimore, uh, it's a major, major issue uh, and deals with integrated planning of our water infrastructure. And then S-451, the Water Resources Research Amendments, but again by Senator Bozeman, that we worked on for additional research into the effectiveness and efficiency of new and existing water treatment work. So there's a lot of important uh, work that's being done uh, for national strategies <clears throat> dealing with modernizing our water infrastructure. I am proud of the impact this will have on the state of Maryland. Um, I, I know that members of this committee may be getting a little bit tired of my mentioning the Chesapeake Bay, I know Senator Carper is not, but, and Senator Van Hollen is not, but others may. But the uh, Chesapeake Bay obviously is a, a matter of major concern. Maryland is a coastal state, uh, and, and the, we, uh, this bill will help us deal with our coastal issues at Chesapeake Bay, and certainly the needs of the Port of Baltimore. We have other ports. We have a port in Salisbury, uh, and making sure that our channels are kept at the, uh, dredged at the, at the right levels. I say that because this bill will deal with Poplar Island and Mid-Bay Island ecosystem restoration projects. And, and I, I really want to underscore this, because when I first came to the United States Congress, uh, the location of sites where we could put dredge material was extremely controversial, extremely controversial. Hart and Miller Island are famous for congressional races based around the future of whether we could find sites to put dredge materials. That's no longer the case in our region, thanks to Poplar Island, which not only serves as a location for dredge material, but it's an it's a ecosystem um, uh, a restoration project. Just recently, I had the opportunity to take the leadership of the Army Corps to the site to take a look at it, uh, and it's, an, it's a model site for what we should be doing in reclaiming uh, lands that were once there, this was once a habitable island that had gotten down to about five acres, it's now being restored to thousands of acres, uh, and it is thriving uh, uh, as an environmental site. Uh, the next location will be Mid-Bay, and uh, this legislation provides for the continuity of the location for dredge sites for, in Maryland, in the Chesapeake Bay, for keeping our channels to the depths that are needed because that's critically important to our economy in the ports. Uh, there's a provision in this bill that deals with the Anacostia River to complete the feasibility study. That's important. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, I want to mention the point you mentioned, and that is the cost-benefit analysis, dealing with smaller uh, facilities. Uh, we have in Maryland numerous sites that are critically important to get uh, Army Corps work to deal with recreational and tourism issues and uh, your leadership here will make it more likely we can get those projects on schedule to get the work that they need. I'm proud to be part of this effort. Thank you, Senator Cardin. I'd like to now ask uh, Senator Bozeman if he'd like to introduce uh, one of our guests. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to take a second to give a special thanks to Dennis Sternberg being here today. Mr. Sternberg has spent almost 40 years in water and 
wastewater industry in Arkansas, hailing from Greenbrier, Arkansas. Uh, 29 of those years were spent uh, working in almost all field positions as a field rep, EPA program manager, uh, <coughs> USDA circuit rider, and wastewater technician trainer. He and his Arkansas Rural Water Association staff are truly committed to the future of rural communities by assisting utilities throughout the state with the many challenges rural and small utilities continue to face. He holds the highest water and wastewater licenses in Arkansas, a class four water distribution and class four water treatment and class four wastewater license in Arkansas. In 2006, Mr. Sternberg received the Executive Director of the, of the Year Award from National Rural uh, Association, and in 2009, the United States Department of Agriculture and National Rural Water Association recognized Dennis for leadership and emergency response preparation. Mr. Sternberg, we truly do appreciate uh, you being here and appreciate you uh, bringing your knowledge of so many years, so much experience to the committee today. Thank you very much, Senator Bozeman. Well, we have a wonderful panel here to join us today. Pat Riley is here, the advisory committee member from the Family Farm Alliance. Mr. Sternberg, who's just been uh, recognized as the executive director of the Arkansas Rural Water Association. Christina Swallow, thank you for joining us. For the president of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And then, of course, uh, Jeff Bullock, secretary of state uh, from Delaware. I understand when you started working for him, you had hair. That's what, the, that's what I hear. That's what this and Tony Pratt, president of the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association. I want to remind our witnesses uh, that your full written testimony will be made part of the official record today. If you could please keep your statements to five minutes so we may have uh, additional time for questions. I look forward to hearing your testimony, uh, beginning with Mr. Riley. Please proceed. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Barrasso and uh, Senator Carper and uh, members of the committee. I'm new to this, so bear with me. Uh, um, my name is Pat Riley. I live near Roundup, Montana, which is in central Montana, the Missouri Breaks country. I'm a farmer rancher and also a consultant uh, throughout the state that works with farmers and ranchers to deal with water rights and water resources issues. Uh, I previously served as a manager of the rivers adjudication in northeast and southeast Montana, which entailed working on the Upper Missouri and the Yellowstone River Basin for a number of issues. Um, prior to that, I managed the Montana's Irrigation Development and Sustainment Program and, and worked with a lot of Indian tribes uh, up till 2014, where I moved back into the uh, private area. Um, I'm, here up, I'm here to represent the Family Farm Alliance and bring perspective perspective for the Upper Missouri and Yellowstone River Basins, where I live and I work. Uh, the Alliance has provided extensive testimony, written testimony, and uh, I am only going to address a couple of different issues, although I do have an interest in many other issues. It's just with five minutes, I, I picked three of those. Uh, the first section that I, that I wanted to talk about was sections 1024. And this deals with the uh, watercraft inspections on the Upper Missouri and the Columbia Basin in regard to the aquatic invasive species issue. Uh, just in the last two years in Montana, we've had two uh, Bureau of Rec projects where, in fact, the zebra mussels, some sign of the zebra mussels has hit our state and we're in panic mode and, and inspections are taking place uh, in Montana, and we're actually formulating that. This will definitely help us to try to preserve our waters, uh, even though the Eurasian milfoil has been in our state for a number of years, and we're trying to deal with that. Um, section 30306 and 3403, um, these are the sections about the reservoir sediment problems um, that we see day to day in our state and throughout the United States. Uh, siltation is a chronic problem throughout the West, and uh, I've looked at reservoirs from BIA, any federal projects to state projects to local projects, and uh, many of the reservoirs are 70 to 100 years old, so um, this means that, uh, you know, that these reservoirs, there are some of the reservoirs I work with that are 50 percent full of silt right now. Well, if you think of that, 
from my perspective as a farmer and rancher, this means that when I had 20 inches of water to use in my crop, now I have 10. I can't raise the crops I need to raise with 10 inches of water. And, and so this is a huge issue, siltation from the farming side. Flood control is also a huge issue. Um, the biggest reservoir in area is, is an Army Corps project, the Fort Peck Reservoir Project. It's 19,200,000 acre feet of water. It's the upper of the three big reservoirs on the Missouri River. Well, if you assume that, say, it was 25% full of silt, which is 1930s vintage, that would be a likely scenario. We're talking about 5 million acre foot that is used for flood control and waters and, and irrigation and those sorts of things. That's a huge chunk and, and it's only growing each and every day. I run into it all the time. We see it out on smaller projects where that is dramatically increased and, and when you have silts of that level, your evaporation goes up because water becomes shallower. Um, the final section uh, that I want to talk about is the tribal, uh, one that's very near and dear to me, sections 3807 and 3808. These are the tribal water right projects. I worked solely on Indian water right projects in our state. We have seven reservations and uh, thousands of acres of irrigation and BIA projects. Most of the BIA projects, I have to admit, are in woeful state and, and very, very, uh, if I was to compare them to Bureau of Rec projects in our state, they're probably 30% worse than the Bureau of Rec projects, who we all know have 100 years of infrastructure that's been sitting there and falling apart. And we need to deal with this. I, I mean, the, on the tribal projects, there's some that I would call almost non-functional. I know that was just a brief of the things that I reviewed, but I felt like I needed to take as little time as possible. And I, I would like any questions that you'd like to provide me later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Riley. Mr. Sternberg. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Brasso, Senator Bozeman, and members of the committee. It's an honor to be here, and we're grateful that you have included the voice of rural America in this hearing. Thank you, Senator Bozeman, for consistently listening to and helping rural Arkansas, including holding the first hearing on Senator Wicker and Senator Highcap's technical assistance bill, which is contained in today's legislation. And thank you as well for sponsoring your SRF win with Senator Booker. Rural and small town USA depends on this committee to ensure that the interests of rural communities are contained in federal legislation. The Great Compromise of 1787 that allows for proportional representation of states, including very rural states, and federal policy is alive and well in this committee and in your legislation. Thank you for that, Senator Brasso, Carper, Inhofe, and Cardin. Rural America is very appreciative for the very helpful and beneficial provisions in your water legislation. America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018, and we urge its passage and enactment. My name is Dennis Sternberg, and I am the Executive Director of Arkansas Rural Water Association, a nonprofit association of small and rural community water and wastewater utilities in Arkansas. But I also am here representing the National Rural Water Association, which has over 31,000 member community utilities. We are very appreciative that your legislation includes numerous drinking water and clean water provisions that make the America's Water Infrastructure Act a comprehensive water legislative package. I would like to focus my comments on the important and beneficial provisions under Title V. Section 5004, technical assistance. Approximately 80% of the country's 14,500 wastewater utilities serve populations fewer than 10,000. As you know, small and rural communities have a much more challenging time complying with Federal Clean Water Act permits and operating complex wastewater systems due to the lack of technical resources in small communities. This legislation provides a solution to the lack of technical resources in small communities by providing technical experts, as we call them circuit riders, in each state to be shared by small and rural communities. For these circuit riders to be effective and helpful, they must be able to directly travel to any given community to work specifically to solve any of their specific problems. Section 5010, the Water Workforce Investment. 
We welcome this new federal attention and emphasize mission for water workforce development. Like me, when I first started working, not every young person entering the workforce necessarily has the option to go to college. A college degree is a value, but is not required. True apprenticeship model would be a welcome enterprise for the water worker universe. In any given day, water workers may be opening, operating heavy equipment to repairing broken lines, working with toxic chemicals, welding, conducting tests, operating process controls, complying with federal rules, managing construction, and the list goes on. Section 5011, Sense of Congress relating to the state revolving funds. Thank you for supporting the funding for the SRS. They are essential in funding water infrastructure and projects to comply with the federal rules, especially the small and rural communities in our state and the country that have more efficiently, more difficulty affording uh, service due to lack of population density. Section 5012, the GAO study on WIFIA projects. We hope the GAO will review the WIFIA program considering it does not require any economic needs-based targeting, credit elsewhere means testing, or focus on compliance. Small and rural communities support Senator Bozeman and Senator Booker's SRF WIN Act, which improves WIFIA by authorizing an opportunity for states to direct some portion of the WIFIA funding to be used by each state's SRFs. Section 5006, Water Infrastructure Flexibility. We support the legislation for improving the current affordability analysis used by EPA to make compliance reasonable on tax or ratepayers, especially in economically dis disadvantaged populations. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, EPA adopted a policy that families can afford annual water rates of 2.5% of the medium household income, which adversely impacts, impacts rural communities that have higher percentages of people living in in poverty in the lower modern uh, MHI. This committee is very important to rural and small town America, and we are grateful for the opportunity to testify today for the attention and consideration you have provided in crafting this most uh, recent legislation, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sternberg. Swallow, thanks so much for being with us today. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Barrasso, Ranking Member Carper, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today to testify on the importance of long-term strategic investment in our nation's water resources. I'm Christina Swallow. I'm a licensed professional engineer, and I'm the president of the American Society of Civil Engineers, a professional engineering society representing over 150,000 members. It's wonderful to be back here in Washington, D.C., where I previously served for three years as a AAAS fellow and legislative aide to Senator Tom Udall. Many of you are familiar with ASCE's infrastructure report card that we release every four years. ASCE's 2017 report card gave our nation's infrastructure a grade of D plus and determined that there is an investment gap of $2 trillion over the next 10 years. Our failure to act economic study found that our nation's deteriorating infrastructure and growing investment deficit hurts our nation's economy. Failing to invest by 2025 carries enormous economic costs to the tune of nearly $4 trillion in lost GDP and 2.5 million jobs lost in 2025 alone. It also costs every single family in our nation $3,400 a year in disposable income. Word of bills are critically important to the health of our nation's water resources which in turn play a crucial role in the nation's economy, public safety, and the preservation of our environmental resources. Our levees, dams, inland waterways, and ports protect hundreds of communities, support millions of American jobs, and generate trillions of dollars of economic activity. As you are well aware, many of these infrastructure assets have reached or exceeded the end of their design life and need to be repaired and modernized Two programs that ASC has long championed are the National Dam Safety Program and the National Levee Safety Program. Both are crucial components of risk reduction and protect communities, critical infrastructure, and trillions of dollars of property. The National Dam Safety Program was reauthorized in WERDA 2014 and has helped inventory nearly 90,000 dams across the country, 
assessing their condition, and providing training and tools to dam safety programs. The National Levee Safety Program, enacted in WERDA 2014, has helped to create an inventory of our nation's levees. We now know the location and condition of nearly 30,000 miles of levees. However, there is much work to be done to further inventory the thousands of miles of levees not yet in the database. We are pleased that America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018, or WERDA 2018, includes a reauthorization of both programs. ASCE is also supportive of alternative financing mechanisms for water resources projects, including the WIFIA program, which can be utilized by the Corps for a variety of water resources projects. We are pleased that this bill includes reauthorization of WIFIA, and we encourage the Corps to continue their implementation of the program. ASCE championed Section 5014 of WERDA 2014, authorizing the Corps to enter agreements with non-federal interests to finance construction of at least 15 water resources development projects. We were pleased that President Trump's infrastructure proposal included provisions to remove barriers to implementation of this program. We urge the committee to follow in the administration's lead by authorizing a user fee collection and retention under this core pilot program. Finally, we ask the committee to include the SRF WIN Act in WERDA 2018. This legislation offers an innovative new tool to leverage limited federal resources and stimulate additional investment in our nation's infrastructure while safeguarding against any cuts to the existing state revolving funds and WIFIA programs. In conclusion, ASCE believes our nation must prioritize investment in our water resources infrastructure systems. Strategic, robust, and sustained investments through long-term reliable federal funding, as well as through the utilization of alternative financing mechanisms, must be made quickly if we hope to close the growing gap and restore America's world-class infrastructure. I thank you for holding this hearing, and ASCE looks forward to working with you and the members of the committee to find solutions to our nation's water resources investment needs. And I look forward to taking your questions later. Thank you so much for your testimony. Mr. Bullock, welcome back to the committee. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Secretary. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, to my governor, Tom Carper, and to members of the committee uh, for the privilege uh, of appearing before you today and offering some, some brief remarks about the America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018 and the importance of this legislation, not just to my state and the Mid-Atlantic region, but uh, to our nation as a whole. I'm Jeff Bullock. I'm the Secretary of State uh, of the state of Delaware, but, um, but today I'm uh, here as the chairman of the Diamond State Port Corporation. Uh, the Diamond State Corporation is a corporate entity of the state of Delaware. It was established in 1923, and it owns and operates uh, the port uh, of Wilmington. Our port, like, uh, like many ports in America, uh, touched the lives of, uh, of millions of Americans every day. The uh, banana you had for breakfast this morning uh, came through the port of Wilmington probably Monday or Tuesday of last week, and three weeks ago was growing on a tree somewhere in, uh, in Central America. The grapes you enjoyed uh, this winter uh, were from Chile, also came through the port of Wilmington. Those little clementines that we love to eat around the holidays, they came from Morocco, also, also through our port. Now, as Senator Carper knows, um, we're in the process of a planned expansion at the Port of Wilmington to provide uh, more capacity for both for our existing customers and, uh, and for future uh, businesses. And that's one of the reasons that this bill is so important uh, to us as we move forward. And just let me say that over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to visit a number of ports, both in the United States and around the world, and perhaps more importantly, to talk to any number of port experts uh, internationally. And I can tell you for certain that many of our ports, including my own in Wilmington, are falling behind and not able to keep pace with our competition. Maintaining marine infrastructure, such as public ports, is, is essential to our nation's economic future. And Delaware and the Corps of Engineers have long enjoyed a great relationship for as long as I can remember and as long as I've been involved in the port, which goes back to the Carper administration almost, uh, almost 25 years now. But the importance of the Corps as we move forward with this expansion uh, is even more uh, essential. The reasons for that are pretty clear. 
We're in the midst of a rapidly changing global marketplace, and ensuring the core is running efficiently is more critical now than perhaps ever before. Ports are strong partners with the Corps of Engineers to ensure that we can meet the trading needs of our country and the needs of the flow of commerce and keep that moving forward. But ports are also under an increasing amount of competitive pressure. Shippers are demanding greater efficiency and lower costs. Increased velocity, the rate at which our goods move through ports and arrive at their final destination, is now the measure of our success. WERDA is an opportunity to look at process improvements as well as make transformational changes in how our nation provides resources to our seaports. Our regional ports also work closely with the American Association of Port Authorities and support the recommended changes in core processes that will make navigational pro projects move more efficiently and support stronger partnerships. The amount of freight that's going to move through U.S. ports is going to continue to increase significantly. Our own port of Wilmington has seen growth of 150 percent just in the last eight years. I want to applaud the work of the chairman and the ranking member on the provision included in this legislation, which highlights transparency and accountability in cost sharing for water resource projects. The foundation to building a project or conducting a feasibility study should always be done in good faith. And with the provisions set forth in Section 1004, local communities and states are now able to see the balance sheets of their respective projects. Furthermore, any unused money from a project that comes in under budget will be credited back to the non-federal sponsor. For states and local communities like mine, who continue to work under tight budgets year after year, this is a big win. Another provision in the bill that we strongly support is Section 1012, Extended Community Assistance to Disadvantaged Communities. Pro uh, properly identifying and understanding the disadvantaged community greatly improves efforts to engage with those community members. In closing, let me say the U.S. Car Army Corps of Engineers is a valued partner in managing states' waters and beaches through navigation, environmental restoration, flood control, and other projects. Without this legislation, the partnership that so many of us count on around the country as vital to our economic growth will be stymied. And as for ports, I'd remind us all of these things. 23 million American jobs are supported by U.S. seaports. Six billion dollars of goods are handled through seaports each and every workday. 312 billion dollars a year in tax revenue is generated by port activity. And 4.6 trillion dollars of economic activity is related to our seaports annually. Very clearly, our ports are a central part of our country's economic future. Thank you again for having me today. I look forward to any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Mr. Boat. Uh, Mr. Pratt, welcome to the committee. We look forward to hearing from you. Good morning. Uh, I want to first of all start by thanking uh, the chairman and, and ranking member for the leadership in, in bringing this bill forward, and as well as the subcommittee uh, leadership in bringing this bill forward is very important, and we keep on a biennial track. Um, I am a uh, representative of the president of the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, of, uh, an organization founded in 1926 that is uh, intended to help care for the nation's coastlines and beaches through science and technology. And uh, we want to start today by saying how happy we are looking at the five-year budget plan that's been proposed. It's, uh, to me, very reflective of the fact that uh, when Earmark's uh, members' requests were uh, eliminated a number of years ago, from a user standpoint, a non-federal partner user standpoint, uh, standpoint, many of the transparencies that we enjoyed in that process of having discussions, open discussions, was lost. We find ourselves in a world of a mystery kind of black box where uh, the Congress is, is, is uh, appropriating funds for Corps of Engineers work. We wait uh, by the sidelines in years of continuing resolution into the mid-spring to find out what work we're going to be seeing coming forward. And we're uh, then at that time able to come up with our matching funds and the Corps has to conduct con contractual work in a short period of time. The five-year budget plan opens this process up to a better dialogue and a better vision for the future. And we look forward to working with the Corps and you all with that. Uh, I like the fact that the bill's incorporation of the integrated water resources management, which is a modern modernization step that will help improve services delivery to the nation. Uh, looking to align authorities, improve opportunities for information sharing, and supporting complementary and integrated solutions to water resources challenges among partners and stakeholders is a valuable step forward for the Corps and its partners and project beneficiaries. 
the required guidance to ensure that the five-year budget and work plans take into consideration a full array of core business lines to maximize the return on the federal investment is supported. This helps put natural infrastructure investments on par with gray infrastructure investments. As I've stated in testimony to this committed committee previously, water and coastal infra infrastructure, just like man-made infrastructure, is about assets the society depends on, and most particularly, it is about U.S. jobs creating jobs and protecting jobs that are blue-collar jobs as well as white-collar jobs. These are American jobs that cannot be outsourced. Service industry at the coast is alive and well and abundantly serves the nation's economy. Investment in natural infrastructure through multi-business line investment secures that economic return for generations, that economic return for generations to come. Another issue that has been challenged in the past is how well informed the conversation on federal resource investment has been. Our observation is that the, best, the benefit cost analysis has not well served that purpose. Uh, it does not consider the return of, of federal investment very well at all. Whereas the total cost of projects are accounted for, there are many national benefits that are not included. This is a disservice to the nation, we believe. We strongly advocate for a more informed BC process that informs appropriators on the full return of national benefits on the investment rate. The five-year budget plan and the integrated water resources approach are a major step uh, forward in realizing this goal. <clears throat> we again thank you for your inclusion of these and look forward to future discussion with you on improving the benefits calculations. And we're also very happy to see the, the call for the GAO study that will examine the possible BC calculation uh, form reforms. This is a wise course of action and very much needed. By the fact that the EPW committee remains committed to a biennial water resource development act, the core civil works budget remains on a forward-looking track, and each subsequent word of provides opportunity to continue to build improvements and modernization of the core civil work mission. ASBPA is also appreciative of the inclusion of the Great Lakes Coastal Resiliency Study, combined with the North Atlantic Study, the South Atlantic Study, and, and Gulf Coast Studies that have gone on. We are perching our nation very much in a, in a better position to have a resilient coastline when future storms occur. This is an objective we strongly support. And finally, the National Academy study is endorsed. This study will take a broad view of the way in which the nation's water resources development projects are delivered. The NAS study should take into consideration how the administration views the Corps' mission and supports it through budget and policy. We strongly support an overview of how the Corps currently, Corps currently operates and if there are improvements that can be made to get projects completed as quickly and efficiently as possible should they be identified and pursued. ASBPA offers our assistance in any way we may find our expertise and experience with coastal water resources protection uh, projects helpful in accomplishing your, your stated goals. I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today and look forward to any questions you may have. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Pratt. Thanks to all of you for your testimony. Uh, we have a diverse group of stakeholders who have already provided letters and statements of support for the Americans, uh, America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018. They include the uh, Family Farm Alliance, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National League of Cities, the National Association of Counties, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the National Rural Water Association, the American Water Works Association, the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, and the Portland Cement Association. I ask unanimous consent to commit all of these, uh, to, get, uh, to submit all of these letters and statements in support of the bipartisan legislation for the record. Without objection, it is done. Um, let me start with a question. Mr. Riley, if I could ask you, please. Uh, you know, developing adequate water supply for future uses in you know, states like Wyoming, uh, Montana, uh, can be difficult because of the regulatory permitting process. We've talked about this. Uh, it can also be challenging when the Corps disagrees with the state uh, about the purpose and the need of proposed water storage uh, or to adhere to unexpected permit conditions that, that come with a permit. But these roadblocks often happen later in the permitting process, upending projects after significant time and resources have already been st spent by the state. So can you explain how future economic growth is impacted in states like my, Wyoming, Montana, when adequate water supply storage is blocked by cumbersome federal uh, red tape? And can, can you explain how this bill will help address this important issue? Senator Brasso, members of the committee, um, usually when these red tape and, and, and these processes are blocked, we've already spent millions of dollars of state and private money to get to that stage, it's kind of like running into a roadblock when the Army Corps 
puts their foot down because the only option for us at that point is to come back to you gentlemen and that becomes very difficult when you live uh, two days flight from from Washington DC um, in the proposal uh, sorry about the section I don't remember about having the uh, the committee or the the group set up it, it gives us a second chance to to lay out our facts because oftentimes the perspective of the man making the initial decision this allows us to have people in the room that understand what we're talking about it gives us a second chance not that we'll always get there but if you kill that momentum, I, I've been in many projects, when you kill it, you kill it. And it's hard to get back. I know of some storage projects we've done in our state that got killed, and they're done. We appreciate uh, following up, the, uh, you know, we know that adequate and affordable water supply is critical to farmers and ranchers, Wyoming, Montana. Our reservoirs across the West and Midwest have, significant, have lost significant water storage capacity due to sediment buildup. Uh, this legislation we're discussing today increases water supply in existing reservoirs by developing sediment management plans for these reservoirs through the use of partnerships between the Corps and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. So if we restore these reservoirs' capacity by removing this excess sediment, what will be the impact for family farmers across the West and Midwest? Senator Brassel, members of the committee, I can address that. From a personal note, I uh, actually farmed in the Milk River Valley, which is a Bureau of Rec project, and our upper reservoir uh, is about 65% full of silt. That stores half of our water supply. So if I can put that in real terms at $200 hay, which is kind of where we talk, uh, that costs me about $300, $350 an acre. As a young farmer earlier in my career, it almost took me out of the business. You can't manage on that, you can't bank on that. That's what that storage really means in a nutshell to the farmer. It could be his malt bar barley crop or his beet crop also. Thank you. Ms. Swallow, th this legislation authorizes several core projects for construction and encourages expedited completion of several projects that are already underway. Each of these projects serves an important purpose, such as providing for navigation, uh, for flood risk management, for hurricane and storm damage, risk reduction, ecosystem restoration. You've seen the list. C can you further el elaborate on why ongoing and future core projects are so critical when it comes to maintaining America's economic viability, including job creation, economic growth, and our global competitiveness? Thank you for that question, Chairman, Chairman Barrasso. The Corps maintains a network of 25,000 miles of inland waterways, 239 locks, and over 13,000 miles of levees. All of these assets help move our goods out to um, other parts of the country, <laughs> as well as our international markets. They protect our communities, and they provide um, access to clean drinking water and other benefits to our communities. Unfortunately, we've not been funding the Corps as needed, and um, these facilities are not just decades old. Some of them are a century old. And while they were designed uh, with the best information we had at the time, they are no longer meeting their needs. They're beyond their design life, and they weren't designed for the traffic they're seeing today. It's critically important for our economy and for our communities that we continue to invest in the Corps, and not just invest, but increase that, that investment to really meet their needs. Senator Carper, thank you all. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to yield to our uh, colleagues. Uh, if, if any of you have time constraints, it would require you. I'm happy to yield. Uh, uh, I'm not in a hurry to get out to, to leave if you, if you need I, to. I'm, not, I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. good with you. I, right. I don't want to miss what you're saying. <laughs> uh, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> all right. Uh, John, John, do you want to go? You want to go first? Go ahead. Go ahead. Whoever doesn't want to hear. <laughs> well, I have some questions for Mr. Sternberg. If you don't, if you prefer. <laughs> Very important. Reclaiming my time. Is it working? <laughs> okay. Very good. 
Uh, I'd like to take a second to offer um, a group of support letters for the SRF Win Act that we've been talking about and some of you all have mentioned in your testimony. This includes the National Rural Water Association, the Council of Infrastructure Financing Authorities, uh, the American Society of Engineers, the Associated General Contractors of America, the American Council of Engineering Companies, the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, Ducks Unlimited, the American Public Works Association, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, the Water Systems Council, the International Union of Operating Engineers, the Vinyl Institute, the Hydraulic Institute, California Association of Sanitation Agencies, Orange County Water District. I'd also like to take a second and thank the uh, EPA Office of Water, the Council of Infrastructure Financing Authorities, American Water Works Association, Water Environment Federation, and the Association of Metropolitan, Metropolitan Water Agencies for providing us technical assistance to ensure that we preserve the WIFI and SRF programs for years to come. Mr. Sternberg, um, let me ask you, you know, you're, you, the SRF uh, has a, a great track record of handling SRF funding to address vitally important water uh, issues, wastewater projects in the state for years. Rural states like Arkansas, though, have limited access to funding. Uh, across the country, SRFs have thoroughly vetted projects from small, medium, and large communities <coughs> that are waiting to be funded. Uh, can you please explain what the additional funding created by another tool in the toolbox like SRF WIM, what would that mean for water infrastructure in rural America? Thank you, Senator Bozeman. That, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and let me just say, Arkansas Natural Resources Commission is the agency in Arkansas that handles SRF for the Drink, Safe Drinking Water Act and Clean Water Act, and they've done an excellent job. Uh, but there's still a need. And with, with this bill, you know, you've got the SRF win in it, and that'll allow the WIFIA program to be much more helpful to some of the rural communities, such in, that we have in Arkansas, which is a very rural state, and many of your states are rural. But not only rural communities, we think it'll steer the, the with you to, to look at the communities with the greatest economic need and communities that each state thinks is the priority. And given the state the priority that handles SRF to say this project needs to be fund, funded. Uh, and it also allows for that low interest rate to come through with the WIFIA funding. Uh, it, it'll be an excellent uh, partnership with the SRFs, and it'll be excellent to, to the utilities across the state of Arkansas and the many states uh, across the nation. Ms. Swallow, we certainly appreciate your leadership and the great job that uh, your organization does in, in uh, constantly pushing us in the right direction and really describing the, uh, the situation that we're in regarding infrastructure. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the growing shortfall in infrastructure funding in the country? Wow. We could talk for days about that, <laughs> Senator Bozeman. Um, yeah, so when we start talking about the, the investment gap needed for our infrastructure systems, you can look at uh, drinking water alone and recognize that we are, we lose billion, we waste billions of gallons of water every day through leaky pipes. Um, that equates to trillions of gallons a year, and we don't have a single drop of water to waste, really, especially um, in the western portions of our country. We have a growing funding gap of, um, currently it's estimated for in the next 20 years, almost three quarters of a trillion dollars. Well, $750 billion is the funding gap on our, on our water and wastewater needs alone. And um, we've got to find a way to invest in this infrastructure. Right. And, and so, you know, we're, we're all doing the best we can. We're working away. But the current situation is, is not near as good as we'd like. So something like, you know, an SRF win type of financing, how would that affect things? You know, first, I want to thank you for your sponsorship of the SRF win act. And, and it well, is myself just... and Senator Booker. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And Senator Booker. Um, it is just one more tool in our toolbox that will help our local communities fund the infrastructure that they need to serve their community's needs. Um, it, it's intended to take the best parts of the state revolving funds and the WIFIA program and provide that access to our local communities where the state infrastructure financing authorities can 
implement the program. It um, provides additional flexibility. It um, doesn't further tax the EPA with another program where the state infrastructure financing authorities are already administering our state revolving funds. So it, it's a great tool. It'll leverage the limited federal funding, uh, $1, up to $50 in additional funding. Um, it's a, it, it'll be just one more tool that our uh, local agencies can use. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Bozeman. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Swallow, if I could uh, follow up on some of this. As you know, our inland waterways are critically important for moving our abundant agricultural products to ports located along our coast. And as the only triple landlocked state in the nation, Nebraska and our ag producers rely on efficient river barge traffic and a functional inland waterway network to supply our overseas customers with our high quality products. As you note in your testimony, there's a great need for investments in maintenance and repair of these inland waterways. Also in your testimony, you emphasize the benefits of WIFIA loans authorized by the Army Corps and that they those loans, the benefits that they could uh, supply to this network. Can you elaborate on how the WIFIA loans could be applied for inland waterway projects? The WIFIA loans are, again, just one more tool that we have. It's an alternative financing mechanism where we can leverage the limited federal investment, $1 up to $50 of additional private and alternate funding sources. Uh, when, when we have insufficient funding, we have to be able to use all the tools that we have in our toolbox, and that is just another way that we can do it. Um, the WIFIA program has just recently been um, started by uh, the Army Corps, and we're excited to hear that, and we're looking forward to their continued, continued implementation of it. Do you believe that um, private-public uh, partnerships are um, feasible? when looking at uh, inland waterways? Do you think that there'll be private enterprise uh, step forward to be able to access that funding? As long as there is a way to offset and for them to see a revenue source, uh, they're a great way to improve our network. And as you mentioned, so many of our products go through that inland waterway system. So I do see that as a solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sternberg, I thank you for once again testifying before our committee. Uh, given your career working with the wastewater infrastructure, I'm sure you're familiar with unfunded federal mandates, specifically those communities facing expensive Clean Water Act compliance requirements related to stormwater and wastewater projects. In my home state of Nebraska, the city of Omaha was hit with a $2 billion unfunded federal mandate from the EPA to update its combined sewer overflow system. I was pleased to see my Water Infrastructure Flexibility Act included in, as Section 5006 in the bill before us, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that. The purpose of this section is to allow communities facing expensive stormwater and wastewater infrastructure updates to have greater flexibility to achieve compliance under the Clean Water Act. Um, Mr. Sternberg, can you please discuss your experiences with communities that are forced to comply with expensive federal mandates? And will this section of the bill help alleviate some of the financial and structural burdens these communities are facing? Thank you, Senator. Uh, my experience in Arkansas, there's about 700 community water systems, and then we have about 350-some wastewater systems. Uh, the, Arkansas, as in Nebraska, is a rural state. We have several, the majority of all systems in the, the nation, 14,500 serve less than 10,000. So when you start passing regulations from EPA down to comply with uh, the same level as a large city such as Omaha, it's harder because you don't have the customer base to spread that cost uh, across the board. It's very uh, hard in, uh, financially uh, on the system, the, the customers of the, of the system, but, but it's got to be paid for some way or another. That's why a grant loan ratio, that's why we think also it needs to be more technical assistance put in for, for circuit riders. That's what we do. We go out there and work with these small systems and larger systems. 
with our equipment. We do the I and I studies on their collection system. There's no need in building a brand new plant if you can fix the I and I. It's kind of like Miss Swallow mentioned the water loss that you have on on leaks on water systems. Uh, you know, let's identify the problems and fix them. Don't build another well or another treatment plant because you got more leaks. It's the same way on the wastewater side. You know, let's let's be reasonable. Let's look at it. That's where the engineers do an excellent job identifying the problems on your utility to try to come in compliance. But we've always argued that, you know, uh, unfunded mandates, you know, you, you, EPA states you need to do this, but they don't fund it. Uh, we've had the same problem on the uh, EPA on our, on our technical assistance funding. You know, back in 2012, it was put out through EPA that it has to get no more earmarks. So in 2012, they had to go out and go through the process of bidding out all the technical assistance. Uh, well, there was several different leg pieces of legislation that was introduced to make EPA streamline and do it with the utilities that's deemed the most benefit with a nonprofit, whatever nonprofit is most beneficial to them. They haven't done that. EPA has not done that. And this Senate, uh, members on this committee have wrote letters to EPA in regard to that about, you know, you need to go back to this rule and do it this way, but uh, they haven't done it. We have letters to back up the letter that the senator sent and then EPA responded back. We've seen um, a huge increase on these bills to the people in the city of Omaha, so I'm hopeful that the flexibility provided in this bill is going to help alleviate some I, of that I, I hardship think definitely they're facing. It will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Fisher. <clears throat> senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Let me uh, open my time by thanking you and the ranking member for the constructive way in which this committee is proceeding on uh, word of legislation. We often find uh, ourselves uh, at odds on certain issues, um, but I applaud the way in which the committee works in bipartisan fashion on the water resources, and I want to particularly recognize uh, the both of you. Um, Ms. Swallow, one of the things that uh, we see is that the march of progress and innovation brings uh, new materials to the fore, innovative materials, often uh, composite materials. Uh, what is your read on how well the Army Corps engineering manuals and uh, other guidance uh, provide adequate uh, preparation for applicants to be able to use those innovative uh, materials and projects? Is, should that be a continuing focus to try to make sure that the standards that have been in place for concrete and steel and other more traditional materials are updated to include innovative and composite materials? Senator Whitehouse, that's a fantastic question. And, and indeed, we do agree that we need to provide for all agencies to incorporate the use of new materials. Uh, we can't continue to design projects the way we did 50 years ago. We can't afford to do that, and the projects won't um, be sustainable. So we need to figure out ways to um, incentivize development of these new materials and their use of the materials and ensure that they do get into our projects. So that and out-of-date engineering and other guidance, engineering manuals and other guidance create a lag uh, that inhibits the uh, implementation of projects that include those new materials, correct? It, it is natural that the standards and guidelines do have a bit of a lag, but the intention there is to ensure that we're protecting public safety and not implementing them too soon. So we need to make sure that we both incentivize the use of them, but also continue to ensure that they're being safely used. Well, I uh, appreciate that. Um, in Rhode Island, we have a lot of small communities, and I uh, see uh, Mr. Uh, Bullock here uh, representing another coastal state with small uh, communities. Um, I have noted that the Army Corps' flood and coastal storm damage reduction account in the FY19 budget um, is funded at $1.49 billion. Of that $1.49 billion, we have found only $40 million marked for coastal projects. Even in the flood and coastal storm damage reduction account, the ratio of upland and inland projects to coastal projects appears to be about 37 to 1, which does not seem 
appropriate under virtually any circumstances, but particularly not appropriate when we look at the type of coastal flooding, coastal storm, lousy FEMA mapping, and other challenges that small communities face. What is your comment on that? Senator, I'm going to, I'm going to not to tell you how to do your job or not, but I'm going to yield to my fellow Delawarean to my left, who's a, the expert in this. Uh, probably not a good I accept for a that secretary. referral. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pratt. Uh, and I'm now retired from the state of Delaware, but 38 years in the business, uh, and that's why my Secretary of State uh, is, is referring over to me. Uh, we, we, we certainly, from Delaware's standpoint and from the national standpoint, we certainly see the problem with that discrepancy, that, that, that small investment made to the coastline. And I think to answer that, I would, I would put out something I've said to this committee in the past. Uh, how far off, I think, for a point of illustration, how far off we are in the investment. And I, and I use the fact that we are depending, in my mind anyway, we, we're depending too much anymore on supplementals to fund coastal restoration work. We're responding, and I certainly see a number of senators. So your recommendation would be that we need to make a stronger focus on coastal restoration we need to make right a into the water program. $65 billion was spent for Hurricane Sandy supplemental, $65 billion. And, and of that, let's just say $20, million, 20 billion of that was probably uh, very much directly coastal related in the affected states. We take that number and we say $20 billion over one storm and maybe 25% of the coast of the United States. If we had spent that money for 20 years over the entire nation, that's a billion dollar investment a year to avoid the damages and to avoid the suffering that occurred before we had to pay that cost of recovery. In my final seconds, let me uh, make the point that Rhode Island has not applied under the WIFIA program for some time now. One of the reasons is that the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank is actually easier to work with, uh, doesn't require such a paperwork load up front, and that for smaller projects and for smaller communities, uh, the WIFIA project really is not all that useful. So I hope that as we continue to work our way forward, we can find ways to make the WIFIA uh, program more amenable to uh, smaller projects and smaller communities, because a great number of our coastal communities are smaller communities. We're not all uh, New York City. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. So sad for you. <laughs> Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for being here. And thank you and the ranking member for working so well together on this. Um, this is really a question for anybody who wants to handle this on the, on the panel. For many of our constituents, how the Corps actually deploys their funds and rehabilitates our waterway infrastructure is, is confusing and ultimately a disappointing maze. First, you have a study that's authorized by Congress. Then the Corps has to complete the study, often soliciting funds from their local stakeholders. Then Congress authorizes the study and appropriates funds to the Corps for construction or operation and maintenance. Still, sometimes after all of this has occurred, nothing really happens. And usually the refrain from the core is that the project failed to pass muster under the OMB's benefit cost ratio. That standard is $2.50 in benefits for every $1 in federal investment with a discount rate of 7% for future or long-term benefits. Very few projects or projects are having trouble meeting this threshold and we're left to explain to our constituents that their project no matter how important to the local community, uh, can't proceed despite all of the federal reviews. So I was wondering, do any of you have experiences that you would like to share in which otherwise worthwhile projects have been put on indefinite hold because of this benefit cost ratio issue? Okay. Um, so maybe that's not a problem. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Riley. Senator Caputo, um, I, I can only do perspective from from some of the projects in my neighborhood. And when, when you use that standard without looking out way into the future, there's much of the projects in our region that would have never been built at that time. So yeah, that is a huge one. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, when you get the Army Corps of Engineers put their foot down on a project you've been working on for 10 years or longer, maybe decades beyond that, that that'll crush you right there in a local-led effort. Right. 
Right. Well, I think this bill tries to help answer that question by letting districts regionalize their projects so they become larger. Mr. Pratt. Uh, just another perspective on the state of Delaware. I think there are 19 or 20 federally authorized navigation channels in the state, only three of which are being maintained. It's a different metric for determining how waterways are maintained, which ones are, are, are actually uh, supported through dredging and, and, and surveying work. We've had channel markers removed in, within our state uh, because the Coast Guard can't verify the poor channel is there anymore. It's a different metric, but it, it gets to the same point, is that, that the rationalization of how we, what projects we do it has to be examined. I think this is why the National Academy study is so important. It should get into that, that way in which the Corps does its business, see how we can modernize it, see how we can bring it forward and, and better serve the nation. Good. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sternberg, um, in your testimony you highlighted in Section uh, 5010, which contains the text of the uh, Water Workforce Investment Bill, which Senator Booker and I have worked on, uh, this provision establishes an EPA grant program to spur education, job training, and apprenticeship for careers. Uh, can you speak a little bit? You mentioned this in your opening statement, but you know, for a rural state like West Virginia, this is a huge challenge. Many of our um, folks that have been maintaining our water systems were under the old system and are retiring and trying to find new uh, and younger talent has been an issue for us. Uh, could you speak to that, please? Yes. Thank you, Senator. Uh, National Rural Water actually started working with the uh, Workforce uh, Development Department of Labor on apprenticeship for the water industry. And this last year, we've just kicked it off, and each state is working through, through that process. But it's the same problem in our state. Uh, aging workforce. We have an aging infrastructure uh, for utilities, but we also have an aging workforce as far as knowledgeable individuals that's run water and wastewater systems for years and getting new young blood to come in to the industry. And one of the reasons I still believe it's it's the, the pay scale is not where it should be. It's the most important thing we do every day. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to have good, safe drinking water. Everybody has to have a process for disposal of your uh, stuff. I mean, it, it does not make sense to me, but I think with this, it ignites and starts the process. And with this in the bill, I think it's an opportunity for every state to start expanding out and going into the workforce and bringing new people in. Well, I have a community, small community um, in, in West Virginia where um, the, the person who was charged with keeping the water system running and, and providing the clean drinking water also was the person who checked the parking meters and, exactly. and exactly. Uh, you know, took the notes at the city council meeting and the dog and all, catcher and everything. The dog catcher and everything. And, and the way the requirements that we have now, uh, you can't do that. I mean, you have to have the professionalization uh, that goes along with this, which can be very complicated. So thank you very much. for that. I, I thank you for, thank you for the addition in this bill for that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Capito. Senator Gillibrand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member for holding this hearing today. Uh, and for your bipartisan leadership in drafting this bill, the America Waters Infrastructure Act of 2018. New York, as you know, has a wide range of water resource needs. We, we are a Great Lakes state and a coastal state. We have hundreds of dams and levees that are critical to communities across the state, which must be properly maintained to ensure those communities are protected from flooding. And we face the threat of aquatic invasive species that, if unchecked, decimate fisheries and result in major economic and environmental damage. I'm pleased that this bill includes a number of our very important priorities. Um, this bill includes the Long Island Sound Restoration Stewardship Act, which reauthorizes and reforms federal programs that are essential to reducing pollution and protecting the Long Island Sound watershed. It also authorizes the Great Lakes Coastal Resiliency Study to protect communities like those that are experiencing devastating flooding last summer along Lake Ontario. And I'm also grateful that the bill will utilize a study for Chautauqua Lake and project to um, uh, the Chautauqua Lake project to protect communities in Westchester from flood risk. With that, just a few questions uh, for Anthony Pratt. Um, I appreciate in your testimony you mentioned the Great Lake Coastal Resiliency Study, which is a priority of mine and something that is so important for communities across central and western New York. As you may be aware, last summer we experienced record flooding along the shorelines of Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River, resulting in federal disaster declaration and due to the millions of dollars in damage of both property and infrastructure. Can you speak a little more about why it's important to conduct comprehensive regional resiliency studies like the North Atlantic study conducted after Superstorm Sandy? Yes, <clears throat> Senator, thank you for that question. It's, uh, it, it, it is one that uh, 
I mentioned uh, briefly a few minutes ago that uh, we support ASBPA. Uh, looking at the nation as a whole, we have a series of, of uh, studies that have done North Atlantic study, South Atlantic study. There are uh, two coastal studies in, in uh, the Gulf Coast and uh, now the Great Lakes coming on board, which brings us to a point where the, the continental United States is, is going to have fairly comprehensive plans without the West Coast engaged yet on resiliency. And there's a number of, of forces at work for each one of those units or sections that is very unique. But, but developing a strategic plan going forward, and so we can, we can spend the money to mitigate prior to the disaster, save the supplemental dollars that are being uh, spent at far too a greater rate. As you understand from the state of New York, $65 billion spent for recovery from Hurricane Sandy. That was after the, the de destruction of property, after the human suffering occurs. Let's avoid the human suffering. Let's avoid the destruction. Let's get out in front of it and invest in that infrastructure that's going to protect the infrastructure that's behind it. And I think the coastal infrastructure is very important in that role. And do you see any projects the Corps could be looking at to improve the resiliency of coastal and Great Lake communities? And follow on, uh, in your view, what are the barrier, barriers that hold the Army Corps back from investing more in natural infrastructure projects like wetlands restoration? And what should what more should Congress be doing to address those barriers? Well, I think this bill tech addresses that pretty well in looking at the full suite of, of benefits across business lines that accrue from the investment made. Uh, looking at green infrastructure or natural nat nature-based infrastructure uh, in the Great Lakes region, there's a lot of bluff erosion uh, because beaches at the bottom of the bluffs are eroding. Uh, Great, Great Lakes levels uh, fluctuate over time because of a lot of weather dif difference in weather patterns. Uh, there are a variety of different forces that work there. But that said, if we can invest in green infrastructure to avoid the, the damages up front, that's good. And um, the, uh, the suite of benefits that accrue by, by enumerating the, the solutions that have multiple benefits, I think the benefit cost analysis is the area where we are not doing a good job on the benefit side, what comes from that investment. There will be many more uh, values achieved through the investment of, of nat nature-based of protection than we are counting, and that's an important step forward. Thank you, Mr. Pratt. Uh, Ms. Swallow, um, addressing the massive backlog of dam and levee safety projects is another important priority. We have approximately 400 high hazard dams in New York. What are the consequences if we fail to take this problem seriously and allow aging dams and levees to continue to fall into disrepair? And how can the Corps provide better assistance to states and localities that are responsible for maintaining this infrastructure but are faced with strained budgets and limited funds? Senator Gillibrand, that's a, that's a great question. And what are the consequences? The consequences are devastating if we fail to maintain our, our levees and our dams. And the challenge with that is that we're not, we're not even aware of the full spectrum of levees that we have. We're underfunding our national dam safety or national levy safety program. Um, we're only spending five to ten million dollars a year, where it's authorized at seventy-nine million a year. Um, and some of those authorized funds actually would go to the repair of those levees. So first we have to identify their locations. Once we know their locations and their condition, then we can start to repair them. In terms of high hazard dams, um, the number of high hazard dams is increasing annually as more and more people continue to move into areas that are protected by these dams. Roughly 17% of our 90,000 dams today are high hazard and should that dam fail, it will result in a loss of life. So uh, the consequences are devastating. Anything the Corps can do to help increase that investment in dams and levees, um, but really it ultimately comes down to ensuring that we're appropriating the funds that are already authorized and making sure that we get those funds to the projects. Thank you very much, Senator Gillibrand. Senator Inhofe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I've got three areas that, uh, as I've listened to the opening statements and, and heard the responses to questions, that I think could use a little more elaboration. Uh, I know that uh, Mr. Steinberg, uh, Sternberg, that uh, and I wanted to tell you, you've got a real champion of rural water in, in uh, Senator Bozeman. Uh, he's one that is always on that ball, and, and we agree with the problems. After all, Oklahoma and Arkansas are both rural areas. We're both uh, impacted by how we do treat that. What I'd like to have you do is to anything you want to add to how this bill is going to be helpful specifically to the rural areas, give you the chance now to elaborate on that should you want to. Thank you, Senator Imhoff, and uh, we appreciate all your work from Oklahoma for rural water, and mm -hmm. my counterpart, James Gamble, would, uh, talks about you all the time, so thank Good. you for the opportunity to add some additional stuff. 
my last comment would be on this bill is, is again, 14,500 water or wastewater systems throughout this nation in every state represent and 10,000 population and under. They're the ones that rely on rural water technical assistance in the field, troubleshooting their problems that they have. Because again, they don't have the expertise as larger systems where they or, have. Or the resources. You know, when you exactly. go around it, I know it's not any different in Arkansas nope. than it is in Oklahoma. And when this hits them, they have no way of responding to it as it might in a major metropolitan area. Exactly. So the technical assistance funding for the clean water uh, circuit riders is essential. It's essential. Mm -hmm. The Safe Drinking Water Act, you know, has the circuit rider uh, technical assistance provision of, of, of 12.7 million. Mm -hmm. EPA is, that's the issue that I have. EPA is a stumbling block because of how they've appropriated that money and put it out. Okay, okay. That, that, that's an excellent statement. I just want to make sure we had everything in the record that uh, referred to. I have, a, I have a letter that uh, you, you, the senators here sent to EPA requesting that they... Uh, I think it would be appropriate to ask unanimous consent that that letter be made, made a part of the record at this point. Without objection. Thank you. Ms. Swallow, I, uh, really 150,000 civil engineers? Did yes. I hear you right? Yes. Yeah, and you're in charge of all that. <laughs> Not so sure I'm in charge. I represent them. <laughs> well, in, in, your, uh, in your statement, toward the latter part of your statement, you did address the, the SRF Win Act. And uh, I just want to remind everyone that not only myself, but also Chairman Barrasso is with uh, Senator Bozeman on this legislation. Now, from your very unique position, is there anything you have not said concerning that you'd like to get in the record? You're the, you're the head of the civil engineers. What do you think? You know, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we're really excited that this bill is being advanced in a bipartisan manner. We're excited to hear that you know, you're working on the SRF Win Act. And, and ultimately, when we talk about our infrastructure, anything we can do to increase the investment, that's the biggest challenge is increasing the investment. We're woefully underfunding it. Okay. Well, I appreciate that very much. And uh, Mr. Riley, in response, you responded to Chairman Barrasso's uh, statement when we talked about local participation. And, you know, there are some people who really don't think a good decision is made unless it's made in Washington. And uh, there are those of us who believe who have served in, in the private sector as well as the public sector at local levels. We don't agree with that. So uh, in your testimony, you say the best decisions on water issues happen at the state and local level. And I would agree with that. The, the decisions they make in Montana are just not the same as they would be made in Oklahoma or in my state of Oklahoma, in eastern Oklahoma versus western Oklahoma. And that's why local uh, uh, decisions and control are so important. Is there anything you'd like to expand on the advantages of the local participation that you have not yet? Thank you, uh, Senator Inhofe. Um, I guess the proof is in the pudding when, in fact, a local effort, that means that we've spent our money before we come to see you, and it's our idea. And I believe that sells it in itself, that, that we have come to you, we've spent a lot of money in, in our state. I've worked on rural water, tribal, state irrigation projects. Mm -hmm. We're coming to you. That means that it's already been originated on our side of the ball looking for help from that you. That is a great reminder, and we'll all recall and remember that. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Inhofe. Senator Carper. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, received a number of letters of support from various outside uh, shareholders and stakeholders. I, I would like to enter these uh, into the record, and they include the League of Conservation Voters, National Wildlife Federation, Audubon, American Rivers, American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, National Association of Realtors, the Environmental Defense Fund. I would just ask that unanimous consent that those letters of support be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to say this has been a great hearing. I mentioned to the, uh, to the chairman um, uh, the, you know, on issues and usually water resources issues, we're, we're very good at working together and, and frankly on other issues as well. Some of our issues that we discussed are more contentious as you might imagine, but this is just a, a great example of what we can, I think, where we can make progress by, by setting aside our differences and f focusing on what Mike Enzi, Senator from um, uh, Wyoming, uh, likes to say, and Chairman's heard me mention this before, but Mike Enzi, uh, 
likes to say that the uh, reason why he did and Ted Kennedy used to get along so well on um, issues of before the Health Education Labor Pensions Committee when Ted Kennedy was senior Democrat, Mike Kinsey, very conservative Republican, was, was the Republican leader on the committee. I used to say to Mike Kinsey, how do you guys get so much done? And he, uh, he once said to me, he said, Ted and I agree on about 80% of the stuff. And we disagree about on 20% of the stuff. And he said, what we do in the Health Education Labor Pension Committee is we focus on the 80% where we agree. And we set aside that 20% to another day. And I think what we're doing today is focusing on the 80%. And you are helping us in this. And we are deeply, deeply grateful. I, uh, I want to ask the first question, if I could, of, uh, of uh, Secretary Bullock. And uh, if I could, uh, with respect to ports and, and then the Corps' budget in that regard. But by, uh, by 2020, I'm told that the total volume of cargo uh, shipped by uh, water uh, in, into and out of this country is expected to be uh, double that of 2001. Think about that. By 2020, expect the cargo shipped into our country, out of our country, uh, to double by uh, 2021. And as the uh, ships continue to get bigger, uh, we see more congestion uh, at the docks, and we see larger ships require deeper navigation channels. It's, we're deepening right now the channel that goes from the Atlantic Ocean through the Delaware Bay, Delaware River up to uh, uh, passed us into uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. But uh, only a few ships, a few ports rather, have uh, that kind of uh, uh, deep navigational channels. How do we uh, ensure that ports can effectively distribute and receive goods as ships continue to grow in size? How do we ensure that ports can effectively distribute and receive goods as ships continue to grow in size? And uh, Secretary Bullock, in your opinion, how does the America America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018 bill for us support our port's needs, not just in Delaware, but beyond, well beyond. Thank you. Right, I appreciate the question, Senator. So I would start out by, uh, by sort of reiterating what you said earlier about, uh, about partnerships and figuring out how to work together on the 80% where you, where you can agree, because I think that's the key, to, uh, the key to success here. We know that, that, that uh, our uh, need for port capacity is going to continue to grow and probably grow, hopefully grow, um, significantly over the course of, of the next uh, 10 or 20 years. And as has been said here today, the, uh, the, the role of the Corps of Engineers in all that is just critical. And I'll take the example that we're involved in right now as, um, as indicative of that. We've already, uh, even before we decided that we were going to try to build a new port, and we were trying to build, an, as you know, a new facility not, not too far from where, uh, where you and I live, um, on the Delaware River, and it's about a 600 to $750 million project to, 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 uh, to, uh, to build this new terminal. Even before we made the full decision that we were going to go ahead with that, we had to start working with the Corps of Engineers um, to determine whether or not the site was going to be suitable for that, right? And even before we bought the piece of property, in fact, we had environmental studies underway to determine whether, um, to determine whether the property was suitable for, for dredging, for example. And now that we are a couple years into it, we're already one year into our partnership with the Corps of Engineers in, in, um, in, uh, in, the, in the dredging piece of that. Um, which is supposed to be, I think, a two or three year process all told, and who knows what happens uh, in between. And so as be has been said several times by this panel in, in, any, in a number of different contexts, a well-supported, well-funded, well-devised plan by the Corps of Engineers is just absolutely critical to, to us being successful. Um, if we can get that port up and running by 2024, 2025, that's, that's pretty good accomplishment, right, uh, to build an, a new port. It's also six or seven years away, which strikes many people as being a long time, but that's how long it takes to do all of this right now. To the extent that we get a well-resourced Corps of Engineers, we can minimize that amount of time, at least from the regulatory perspective and getting the approvals that we need. So that is critical. To the other, to the other part of your, of, your, of, your, of your question about the ships getting larger and and um, and the changing the, the changing nature of, of the businesses that as 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 it relates to that, we know that the ships coming up the Delaware River are only going to be so large, and uh, we now can because of the deepening of the channel, we can now handle larger ships. We can't 
we can't handle the largest ships, but it's a sort of spoken wheel um, uh, business practice in, in, on the part of most of our customers anyway, and so we won't, that is not gonna hold, that's not gonna hold us back. Making sure that channel um, is that channel deepening is completed. Making sure that it is then maintained after it is completed. Making sure that we uh, accommodate things like um, where we put dredge spoils, for example, which is going to be a very big issue for us, and maybe not in the short term, but certainly is going to be in the long term. These are the things that that uh, will allow us to maintain um, our commercial development and it will make us successful um, uh, in the in the longer term. So the overall message, I think, for me, and I heard it from others, is this is, if you want to, I know we all have our budget constraints. We certainly do um, in the state of Delaware. This is not a place to cheat. Um, this is not a place to cheat the budget. And this is a place where you will, not only will you facilitate things like what we're doing in Delaware, but you'll do the, the exact same thing around the country. You'll add, you'll grow jobs, you'll grow the kinds of jobs that we need to be developing in our country right now, kind of blue collar jobs. Um, that uh, we so desperately need to uh, to uh, to increase, and uh, and you're going to promote more economic development in our country. Thank you for an excellent uh, ex excellent thought thoughtful response, Mr. Chairman. I, I have maybe another question to ask you, Tony. But uh, let me please just go right ahead. Are you sure? Please. Go. Right. Um, uh, president Pratt, the uh, as the president of the uh, American Shore and Beach uh, Preservation Association, with a long rich history uh, with uh, coastal issues. And as a former non-federal project manager for the state of Delaware, you know the importance of pairing natural infrastructure improvements with uh, engineered flood control solutions and how they can complement each other. How can gray and green infrastructure work together? How can gray and green infrastructure work together? In what ways does uh, the bill before us actually support that, that hope, that aspiration, please. Uh, thank you. Good question. Um, so gray infrastructure at the coastline is, is refers to uh, the kind of practices that were done in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, perhaps, where sea walls were built, uh, bulkheads were constructed, breakwaters were constructed. It became a way of trying to tame the forces of nature that were impacting the coast. Over time, we began to look, a, took a look at it from a broader perspective. You stop and think just for a minute what attracts so many Americans to the coast. It's, it's not a wall and a, and, a, and a sea on the other side of it. It's a beach, it's a dune, it's a wetland. And those beaches, dunes, wetlands, the vistas that they provide for people, uh, the recreational benefits, but also the protection of estuaries, which is very vitally important. We have seen the collapse of protection in the Delta in, the, in Louisiana, for instance, the Chandelier Islands and their collapse. Uh, created devastation of wetlands, losses of wetlands, uh, more exposure of, of New Orleans to coastal storms. And so looking at systems that, that bring back those, those natural features that is why we went to the coast. We didn't congregate at the coast because it's a solid wall and then there's a sea on the other side. Those amenities, those resource values are very important to people. So bringing those back into the fold, they can perform very well. We think, we think uh, in our minds about the Dutch and the way they protect their country, which is below sea level. And I used to think of it, there were probably giant walls everywhere. And I've seen photographs, I've not been to Holland to examine it, but I've seen photographs and their, their protection, their dikes, as they're called, are dunes and beaches. Massive dunes and beaches that are providing recreational amenities, uh, natural resource amenities, but also do the job of keeping the sea back. So combining the two, I think, is a way forward that accomplishes many goals. And I think the, the National Academy study and the, and the GAO study are looking at the benefit cost analysis should pick up on some of those values that come from that investment. Thank you. Um, would you just mention what's going on at the uh, uh, Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge with respect to uh, transforming a, uh, a freshwater marsh into a, uh, a saltwater marsh in order to, uh, to sort of raise it up Mm -hmm. and uh, really to save and preserve it. Yes, certainly. The, um, the National Wildlife Refuge at uh, Prime Hook is, is one that was a Del is, a, is a Delaware Bay fronting uh, resource. It was managed it was for a number of years because of mismanagement of, of the streams and creeks that went through that wetland system back in the early part of the last century. Uh, Phragmites took over, dominated the coastline. There was a beach and there was seas of, of Phragmites, a tall reed that, that we see all over Delaware. To, um, to reverse that, 
uh, non-productive land, uh, the, Corp the, uh, the Department of Interior, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, created impounded freshwater wetlands um, back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, those, were, those, those provided tremendous benefit to migratory waterfowl for quite a number of years until the beach and dune system broke down and, and seawater got into that system and created a, um, a tidal anomaly that didn't allow the, those wetlands to, to flow out. Uh, bottom line is that through Hurricane Sandy Relief, $38 million was appropriated to the Department of Interior to rebuild the beach and dune and to create a wetland system that was based on tides again. Again, entirely uh, valued by and, 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 and um, uh, benefit cost analysis was strictly on the environmental improvements that would come in the, in the benefit it would provide to migratory waterfowl, which is the mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So the values are there. They're very high values. And and Department of Interior looked at it closely and said, yes, it's very much in our favor to go ahead and make that investment, $38 million, to restore a complete system to its original natural function. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 let me go back. But if, if I have a question I'd like to ask later on, no, a very short on, question, Ms. Swallow. Please but, go on. I was sitting next to Tom Udall in a meeting earlier today, and uh, I'm sure he would want to convey his uh, his uh, warmest regards and his thanks for all the help you provided when you were a member of his staff. Uh, Ms. Wallace, do you believe that the uh, Corps' current budgetary funding is sufficient to accomplish its mission for inland waterways, and how does this bill assist on this front? Thank you for the question, Senator mm -hmm. Harper. Is the budget sufficient? No. It's not. Um, we have infrastructure on our inland waterway systems that dates back not just decades, but in some cases, as I mentioned earlier, a century. And that infrastructure is struggling to meet the needs of our nation. And if we don't fully um, restore our inland waterway system, we will see the impact of that, that product instead of being shipped on the inland waterways, it will hit our surface, the rest of our surface transportation system and cost us a lot more, not just in terms of the cost for the producers who are trying to get their products to market, but will cost every single American citizen as we buy that product. So we need to find a way to further improve the investment um, in our inland waterway network. One of the things that um, we really like about this bill is that it enables the core to charge and, co and collect fees um, on their facilities that they can then use to leverage the WIFIA program. Um, we will not attract private investment unless we, they know that they can see a return on their investment. So that is one of the steps that we're excited to see in this bill, is it allows um, the core to start uh, collecting and retaining fees for operations and maintenance. Uh, we, of course, um, like that the bill is reauthorizing uh, WIFIA and the dam and levy safety programs as well. Yeah, thanks. Whenever we say dam safety programs, I was thinking, is that with, with the N or just? <laughs> <laughs> Why well, we, we know here for the record today is just DAM. That's, that's good. Well, this has been great. And Mr. McChurman, thank you uh, again for pulling us all together and for our witnesses that are here from Delaware and other places far and wide. But uh, again, I just want to say to our staff, uh, deeply grateful for the great work that's being done. Um, out. Uh, not, uh, not in the, uh, the light of day so much, certainly not here under these lights, but they're very good at what's being done. And we know a lot more needs to be done, so we look forward to that, uh, look forward to that journey. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, Senator Carper. And you were kind enough to mention so many of this stuff. I think Richard's name was left out, so Richard, we apologize, but are grateful for your great work. I'd like to say something about Richard. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, well, there's no more questions. Members are, may submit follow-up questions for the record. So the hearing record is going to be open for two weeks. I want to thank all the witnesses. Thanks so much for your insight, for your time, for your testimony, Senator Carper. Just an observation. I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Secretary Bullock was once my uh, chief of staff when I was a governor and later for a while as, as, uh, as a um, uh, United States Senator, and he was uh, succeeded as chief of staff by Jonathan Jones, who's sitting immediately behind him. And immediately behind uh, J Jonathan Jones is a fellow who looks very much like Alan Hoffman, who used to be chief of staff to Joe Biden as senator and as vice president. I don't know who the rest of you are. But <laughs> <laughs> Would people like to stand and introduce but, themselves but, and we can kind of work our way through the crowd? This is one, the, heck, one heck of a Delaware lineup right here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carper. Thanks to each and every one of you who've attended as well as those who participated by uh, testifying. But with that, the hearing is adjourned.